Det var inte ens lite kul. see in the verse of the day the verse of the day is John chapter 10 verse 11 it says I am the good shepherd come on the good shepherd sacrifices his life for his sheep and I get to thinking of David and many times that his sheep left away and he had to fight a, a, a lion he had to fight a bear but guess what the Lord fought much more than that for us the Lord fought death the Lord fought sin and he sacrificed his life for us so we can have eternity with him amen Maybe I'm the only one fired up about that this morning. But I know I'm excited to worship the Lord. Amen. Father God, I pray that you just begin to have your way right now, dear Jesus. Lord, as you begin to breathe your life into this room, Father God, let us all feel the presence of the good shepherd that sacrificed his life for his sheep this morning, Father God. Just have your way in this service, Lord, and let your presence be with us in this place. And it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen.
now into this next song but just encourage you to enter in and worship don't worry about everything going on give everything you have all of your problems just give it to Jesus for his yoke is easy and his burden is light
Because we're not chasing the blesser, but we're chasing the blessing. I feel like so many times we get caught up in our faith because we're chasing the healer or the healing and not the healer. We're chasing the finances, but not the financer. So many times we want this thing, but we don't want the one who gives it to us. We want life, but we don't want the creator of life. We want so many things and we come to church week after week and we tithe week after week chasing a blessing. But I got news for you. The Lord knows your heart behind all things. And we can show up here week after week and check it off and look like we have it all together and raise our hands to our worship. But the Lord knows your heart. If you're really only here because you want something from Him, guess what? He already gave you something. It says, Lord, I'm not here for blessings because you don't owe me anything. Hello. The Lord doesn't owe you anything in this house. Stop acting like He owes you something. God died for you. Hello. He gave you something. God gave you his only begotten son. God gave us the best of the best that he had to give us. And so many times we still want more from him. God, you gave your son, but that's not enough for me. This song says nothing else will do but Jesus. Nothing else will do on this earth but Jesus. Hello. So many times it says, I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. Hello. We come and we just sing another song. We go through these routines. But it says, Lord, take me back to the beginning. Come on. So many times we've been in this relationship with the Lord for, for 20 years maybe. And now it's just routine to us. But it says, Lord, take me back to the beginning where I was hungry for you. Lord, take me back to the beginning where I didn't expect anything from you. I was just thankful for you and who you were and what you did for me. Some of us today, we need to go back to the beginning. Lord, take me back to the beginning of when I first encountered you. My first experience with you, Lord. Take me back to the beginning. Amen. Lord, have your way this morning. Woo. You can find your seats this morning. I'm sorry, Pastor. I wasn't trying to preach. If I'd have kept going, I'd have took up his sermon time. Listen, first and foremost, I just want to thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart that have helped support our youth in, in this summer camp. I want to thank each and every one of you who have given a dollar. Amen. I want to thank you who handed me, even just this morning, donations. Thank you so much. It's because of you that our children and our youth are going to be able to experience God at summer camp this, this year. Amen. Last year, our students had that privilege stripped from them, and this year, they're hungrier than ever to go to summer camp and have that week alone with the Lord. Amen. So first and foremost, I just want to say thank you for those of you who have donated. Listen, if it's still on your heart to donate, um, each kid is, is 220 bucks in total. Uh, most churches will try and charge 240 um, just so they can get a little bit back and they can cover their gas and they can cover what they got to cover. Listen, I told the students 220 whatever else I'll cover. Okay. Uh, and I just want to thank you for helping our students. Listen, we are so close. We are so close. And our kids have been crushing it. They've been working fundraisers, and they're hungry. So once again, thank you guys for that. 
uh, water baptisms. If you are interested in being baptized in water, if you've recently given your life to the Lord, maybe rededicated your life to the Lord, uh, there's forms in the foyer that you can fill out. You can drop in the offering bucket, or you can even turn it into the church office and say, listen, I'm ready to make that public, um, that public display of faith to say, listen, I've given my life to the Lord. I'm dying to the old man and coming out a new creation. Amen. We have Kids Summer Fun coming up. Listen, it's going to be our, our VBS this year. It's going to be June 28th to June 30th from 6 to 8.30 p.m. Listen, I know our kids are going to have a blast. If there's one thing I know about Steve Henson, is he's a great guy and he cares for your children. He cares for the kids this age because he knows that these, these kids aren't the church of tomorrow. Hello. They're the church of today, just as we are. And he knows that, and he invests his time and his love into these children so that they can come up to me and eventually be the church that's in this room. Amen? So once again, if you'd like to have your kids come out and have a little bit of fun from preschool to fifth grade, uh, Pastor Steve would love to have you out there and join your time with him. If you'd even love to serve, um, you can reach out to Steve and uh, see what you can do to help. Fourth of July picnic is coming up. Listen, Fourth of July, if, if it couldn't be any more patriotic than this, it's going to be on a Sunday. Come on, somebody. Um, we're going to have a, a picnic right after service, Sunday afternoon. Uh, mark your calendars now. Listen, plan it ahead of time. I know many people like to take vacations. Um, they plan on having a full day of partying. Listen, come here. Let's have some fun on wet slides. Let's have food uh, and have a good time together. Amen. Listen, if we have any first-time guests in the building, I'd like to say welcome. I'd like to say thank you for coming and spending time with us today in the presence of the Lord. If this is your first time um, on the seat back in front of you, there should be a guest form. If you'd like to fill that out and turn it into our, our information center, uh, we'd like to put a gift in your hand. I actually don't have my gift. It's sitting by Pastor right now, but it is a notebook, and it says Hilliard First Assembly of God on the front of it. it has a big, beautiful cross. It comes with a pen. So you can take notes during service. Come on, somebody. Next, I'd like to go ahead and invite our ushers forward as we move into our next step of tithes and offerings. Listen, this morning, as I was teaching the youth in Sunday school, um, one of the biggest things that we talked about was the lie that we're all going to be successful. And we, we get, began to name successful people off. And we ranked them 1 through 10. And I said, well, what defined that success to you? They said fame and money. That was how they ranked those people and how successful they were. Well, we began to look at how God ranks our successfulness on earth. And it brought us to Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. If I could read it to you just really quick. I had it pulled up nice and ready to go. Then my phone messed up. Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, I'll summarize it. Um, there's all the rich people in the church, and they're coming forward, and they're giving their big gifts to the Lord, and they're putting it in the, in the tithes and the offerings. They're hundreds of dollars, and they're gold, and all the best herbs and essence they have. Well, then came a little old lady who was poor, and she gave her two copper coins. And Jesus stops them all, and he says, listen, I want you to know that this woman right here has given more than each and every rich person. And the rich people begin to sit back and wonder, how is that possible when I gave 10 hundred times the amount that she gave? Because Jesus doesn't rank us by how much we give from the financial side, but how much we give from the heart side. Listen, the Lord wants to know your heart this morning. It's not about giving so the church can stay running. It's not about giving so the, none of this. It's so that the Lord can know where your loyal is to him, how loyal you are to him and where your trust is. Amen. Father God, we pray that you begin to have your way over this service. Father God, have your way over this offering, dear Jesus. I pray that you begin to bless us as we give this morning to you, dear Jesus. I pray that you just begin to move forward with your word, dear Jesus. Let this offering help someone come to know you, Father. And it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen.
Amen. How many of you want more of Jesus in your life? Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, worship team. Nothing else. Boy, I tell you what, I thought he was going to preach my message this morning. And uh, that's okay. It's okay. I want to do something different this morning. Um, we, we don't do this very often. Probably maybe it's B VBS. <laughs> okay. But I'm going to ask you if you would stand one more time. And I want us to do the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Then we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance to the Christian flag. And then we're going to do a Pledge of Allegiance to the Bible. And, uh, you know, we don't think about that. But today we're celebrating this weekend Memorial Day. And we're taking time to uh, remember things that have taken place. So, if you will, let's face the American flag. And did we get it up? There, there they all, I knew y'all knew all these by heart, but just for me, we put it up there, okay? Because uh, we do this so often, amen? <laughs> Would you just uh, put your hand on your heart and let's just do this. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, in justice for all, amen. Let's look at the Christian flag. This one here might be a little more challenging. You kind of look one eye this way, one eye that way, okay? I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One brotherhood uniting all mankind in service and in love. And I'm going to ask if Brian would hold the Bible and turn around and face you. And we're going to also make a pledge to the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my flight and a light unto my path. I will hide its word in my heart that I will not sin against God. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Would you remain standing just for one more moment? I want to pray over some folks. Uh, some of you get our email, some of you don't. Um, this week has been a very busy week for my family. Um, my brother-in-law, Ed, went to the hospital. He's in ICU. Uh, he's got an infection. Uh, and so I just ask that you would just remember him. Uh, he's up at Baptist uh, downtown, um, and they've got to get that under control. Also, my wife's mother, her sister, and our brother-in-law uh, all came down with COVID. He went into the hospital on on uh, Monday and uh, has been there. He's supposed to get out today, but her mom and sister at home, uh, her name is, uh, mom is Dolly and sister is Pam, but Pam is still uh, doing pretty bad. Uh, Donna may have to run her to the hospital. If you hadn't seen her today, it's because she left to go try to take care of them the best she can. Uh, she stayed in a hotel, dropping food off at the door and doing what she can and uh, but just pray that God would protect them. Would, would you just agree with me? Also, let's remember uh, Cindy Burke. I did talk to Cindy this week, and Cindy is doing better. Um, I just, you know, I, she told me, she said, Pastor, I'm walking up in the hallways up here about a half a mile to a mile a day. And, I, boy, that is awesome. So <laughs> praise God for that. Amen. So uh, let's just continue to pray for her and these others, and, and I'm sure many of you have needs, so let's lift them up. Father, today we come before you, and Lord, we know that there's nothing too difficult for you, and I ask you right now to reach down and touch these that are sick. Lord, touch Ed in that hospital room today and cause that infection to clear up. Let the, the healing power of Jesus flow through him this morning. Lord, I lift up to you Donna's family, and I pray that you would touch her brother-in-law, Louie, and, and Pam, her sister, and her mama, Dolly. God, that you would heal them of the sickness of this virus, Lord. Bring wholeness into their body, and Lord, I pray your protection over 
over my wife, that you will keep her from any kind of sickness from this. Lord, I just pray your hand of mercy upon them. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to touch Cindy Burke today. Lord, continue to heal her body and strengthen her. Lord, I pray that you do the miracles in her life. And Lord, for the other needs that are represented in this building today, we lift up to you those folks that need a healing, that need a miracle. God, watch over them. And Lord, we pray for those that have gone on a trip, Lord, Lord, this weekend, on this holiday weekend. God, we pray that your blessings and favor and protection will watch over them. Bring them all back safely, we pray, this next week. And we'll give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, and the church said, amen. 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 You might be seated. Hallelujah. Um, one more thing I want to do before I really get into my message. If you're here this morning and you have served in our military, and you're a veteran, or you're presently serving in the military, uh, would you just stand to your feet? We want to just show our appreciation to you. Amen. Come on, let's show them. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much for your service. We thank you. We got some guys. I don't know how many of you were here last week, but we got about four or five guys that are going into the military in just about a month or so. You may be seated. And we're proud of that. I, I tell you, I was so proud last week. Like, I'm not even their daddy or nothing, but, but when I heard that they were going to the, to the army, it was like, wow, that's great because you don't hear that anymore. And I praise the Lord for those who are willing to serve our nation. You know, uh, today I want to just kind of talk a minute about what is Memorial Day all about? You say, well, Pastor, that's not in the Bible. Well, I'll get there. Just hold on. Okay, don't go anywhere. But what is Memorial Day all about? Well, you see, Memorial Day is an American holiday honoring the men and women who died while serving in the U.S. military. That's what it's really all about. You know, I, I saw some pictures. I don't look at Facebook very much, but I did glance, and I saw guys getting off these, these landing craft, getting ready to go up on the beach, you know, and I'm thinking back to where they had that D-Day, you know, and all these guys walked up. Most of the boys on that, that ship that were landing on that, that sh on that beach there, those guys were probably not more than about 17, 18, less than 20 years old, and almost every one of the first ones who arrived on the beach gave their life and never was able to, to do anything. Ever. I mean, you know, they just gave their life right there. It was all. They gave it all right there. And so today, we take time to remember those men as well as others who have served our nation for giving us the freedom that we have in this nation to worship in the house of the Lord. Amen? Forgive us the freedom to do as we get to do in our nation. You know, I've been in some communist countries, and I've been in China, I've been in Cuba, I've been in a couple other places where, you know, they don't have the freedoms that we do. But I praise God for the men and women who have fought for us and given us victory. And so we talk about this as a, a day to remember them and remember what they've done for us. You see, this day is to honor those who gave their lives. They gave the ultimate sacrifice for our country. And we spend this day remembering those who gave their lives so that we could have the luxury and the freedom that we are experiencing today. You see, a memorial can be a monument, it could be a statue, it could be a holiday, or even a ritual that serves as a remembrance or a reminder of a person or some type of an event. And so when we think about that, there are all kinds of memorials set up around our nation. But I want you to know in the Word of God, there are many memorials that have been established as well. And that's what I want to talk to you today about, is really Christians also have memorials. And the first one that I'd like to share with you this morning is a memorial that took place in Exodus and if you think about the Bible back in chapter 3 of Exodus, and I'm not going to read you uh, about, you know, 12 chapters or 9 chapters this morning. I don't have time for that. But if you'll remember, the Israelites had moved into to Egypt whenever uh, Joseph had been sold into slavery. Remember, after he had been there a while, and, and so they all moved up there with their family during the famine. And for 400 years, they served as slaves in Egypt. 
And God spoke to Moses in chapter 3. He goes to the burning bush and, and the bush is not being consumed, but it's on fire and God speaks to him. And he says, I want you to go and I want you to set my people free. So Moses responds to that and he goes over to Pharaoh. He said, Pharaoh, God said to let his people go. And Pharaoh said, ha, huh, they're just a bunch of lazy bums. It's my paraphrase, okay? <clears throat> And he says, you know what, just for that, I'm not going to give you any more straw so you can make your bricks. Now you've got to make just as many bricks, but you're going to have to go out and gather your own straw too. Boy, it made things tough. And we can go through the whole 10 plagues if you want to, or I like to call them 10 miracles. But I want to take you to the very last one. And on that very last miracle that I would call is a time that we see in chapter 12 where God spoke to Moses and said, Moses, I want you to tell the people of Israel to go and get a lamb, a one-year-old lamb. I want you to take that lamb and I want you at twilight to slaughter that lamb and I want you to take the blood of that lamb and I want you to apply it to the doorpost of your house and your dwelling and across the lintel, the top of the doorpost, because tonight I'm sending a death angel into Egypt and anyone who doesn't have the blood applied to their doorpost and to the top of the mantle of their, of their, or, or the lintel of their house, the death angel will come and the firstborn of every household will die. So all the Israelites took and they lived in the land of Goshen there in Egypt and they slaughtered that little lamb and they took and they put the blood on the doorpost and across the lintel up there. And that night when the death angel came by, guess what? He passed over all the Israelites. Why? Because he saw the blood. How many of you are thankful for the blood this morning? You see, he passed right over them. So our first memorial that I want to talk to you about in the Bible that, that I just really want to bring a reference to is the known as the Passover. The Feast of Passover is something that God said that you should do from now on in remembrance of how I delivered you from the terror that you were in and the punishment that you were in and the bondage that you were in and I set you free. How many of you have ever been in bondage before? Three of you. How many of you have ever been in bondage before? Certainly we have. Some of you have been in addictions and all kinds of bondage to things of this world. Some of you say, well, I never had smoked, I never drank. Yeah, but you've been addicted to other things in your life too. Hello? Let me give you a profile view. You ever been addicted to food? <laughs> it's one of them things that you deal with. But God can bring deliverance, amen? Amen as he did to the Israelites on that day. And as he was there, Moses said, take that blood and apply it. And so I look at verse 12, or chapter 12, and in verse 14, it says here, this is the day you are to commemorate for the generations to come, and you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, as a lasting ordinance. This is the same, as if you will, as our memorial day today. It is something that is set aside that on that occasion, this is declaring the first month of the Jewish year, if you would. And he says, this is the day that you will remember how I brought you out of bondage. Somebody get excited. What's that word you like to use last week? Hello. Hello. <laughs> I heard that so many times. I, I like that, man. You're going to have to teach me how to say that in the right place. I guess that's instead of Amen. Hello. <laughs> I love you, Brian. You see, the feast of the Passover is a great one that we need to remember. And it's always right after this, you know, it's that first month of the new year of the Jewish calendar. The second one that I want to talk to you kind of goes in line, but it comes about 40 years later. Remember when the Israelites ran away from, from the Egyptians and they got up and their backs were to the sea. They had the mountains to one side. The Egyptians were coming from another. The only thing that separated them was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And Moses got concerned. Lord, why did you bring us out here to die? You know, and Lord, you got to do something. And the Lord said, Moses, just pick up your, stack, your stick. Hold your stick out there. Hold that staff out there. And what happened? God blew the waters apart. And he walked across on dry land. Are you hearing me? 
And it wasn't just 100, it wasn't just 200. Come on, how many of you know there were over 600,000 men? And that's just the men. Matter of fact, it was a couple of million people that had to cross across the Red Sea. How many of you know God knows how to work miracles? Have you ever noticed how he makes things a little more difficult before the miracle takes place? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, how many times have we seen where things were even harder just before the miracle broke through? I think about Gideon and how God had given him so many men. And he said, Gideon, you got too many men. Gideon, you need, you need to get rid of some of those men because you're going to think you did this on your own. How many of you know God doesn't want you to think you did it? He wants you to recognize that it was him who that performed the miracle. Some of you might get a little pride in your heart. Hello. Anybody with me? Might get a little proud. Well, when it came time after going around and, and you know, 40 years in the desert... Can you think of some of the experiences they had in the desert? Moses, we're tired of this manna. Give us some quail. Give us some meat. Give us, man, God said, I'll give you quail. It was, it was deep. Man, they were walking through the deep quail. They were trying to get through it. It got to where it became stench. It became, oh, man, we're tired of quail. We're thirsty. Moses, we want water. And Moses goes over and says, Lord, we got to have some water. And God gives him water out of a rock. Come on, are you hearing me? Then he goes up to another place, and we know it as a place called Mara, and they get there, and the water is bitter and sour. And he said, Lord, what are we going to do? He said, throw the stick in there. And the stick went in, and the water turned sweet again. Hello? How many of you know God looks at the difficult things and says, I want you to realize this is worse than you think, but I can make a difference. And so God works the miracles. And we see these miracles taking place. And so for 40 years, they've walked across. Their clothes are the same. How many of you know their shoes didn't wear out? Their clothes didn't wear out. 40 years, some of you folks would die. You say, I've been wearing the same old clothes forever and ever. You know what? I could do that. It doesn't matter to me. My wife says, you need to get rid of that. You've worn that too long. It's starting to wear. It's this. Man, I don't care. I'm just not one of those got to be fashionable. I, I'm sorry. Just an old old boy. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. You know, I don't have to have the brand new shoes. I don't have to have the brand new name brand pants or the, you know, I, I, you know, me, I think if my pants get a hole in them, I'm supposed to throw them away. But now it's the fashionable thing to have holy pants. Hello. <laughs> when I was a kid, what did they do? They put patches on there. And you were embarrassed because you had a patch on your pants. Oh, well, I'll get off of that. But the Israelites have went through the desert and they get to the, to the Jordan River and the, and the title had changed from Moses being the leader to Joshua being the leader. And Joshua says, man, we got to go across the river. God's given us the promised land. There's Jericho. This is the first battle. And how are we going to do this? The river is at flood stage. I mean, it'd been okay. It wouldn't have been so bad if it had been in this normal stage, but it's, it's out of the banks. It's flowing so hard. How are we going to get across the river? God makes things difficult, doesn't he? Because he wants you to know that it's God who's working the miracle. And Joshua has a little conversation with the Lord, and the Lord says to Joshua, Joshua, have the men carry the ark, and when they get out there about ankle deep or so, the water is going to start to recede. And the water began to back up, and it began to push back farther and farther, and again, those two million plus people go across the Jordan River. How many of you know it didn't take 30 minutes to get a couple million people across the, the Jordan? You ever had to stand in line and just try to move forward? Have you ever been in a crowd where you're like stepping on each other and you're waiting for a little spacing? To, oh, finally I can walk a little bit, you know? I, I have that problem because I have long legs and, and I'm not good at walking little baby steps in crowds. I, I kind of like to stride. When I walk in the mornings, my wife, you know, when she tries to keep up with me, I have to keep stopping and looking back. and You know, it's just I got to stride. It's a, 
a long stride. You know, I, I went to the hospital yesterday and got off the elevator. There's two ladies there, and I let them off being the gentleman you're supposed to be. But then they were... As soon as I got a break, it was like, I'm gone. I can just imagine there were people in that line going across the Jordan River that day. But when they got in the middle of this thing, Joshua told one from each of the 12 tribes, said, look, when you're going across, the Lord told me to tell you this. He said, I need one representative from every tribe to pick up a stone out of the middle of the Jordan about the place where they're holding the Ark of the Covenant. And you're to put it on your shoulder. So how many of you know the stone wasn't something you could just hold in your hand? It wasn't a rock. It wasn't a pebble, but it was a stone of some significance. And they put it on their shoulder, and they walked on a cross. I thought about this the other day when I was reading this. and You know, if that river has been at flood stage, I'm thinking... You ever walked in a place where the water has been standing and, you, and your feet kind of go squish, squish, squish? Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's just kind of mushy, you know? Then they're going to add an extra 50, 100 pounds on their shoulder. <clears throat> you know, kind of that thing. But they carried that stone to the other side of the river on the west side of the Jordan. And Josh says, wherever we come out here where the, where the ark was and where we camp tonight, we're going to lay those stones down and we're going to make a pile here to make a monument. He said, well, what in the world are we doing that for, Josh? Why have we got to do that? And Josh says, look, this is what the Lord said. He said, whenever you bring your children down here to the Jordan or you pass by this way, people are going to say, what in the world is that pile of stones doing there? They didn't have anybody and you know sign some kind of big sign down there saying this is the stones that Joshua put here. No, he says, but you tell them, those stones represent how God brought us across the Jordan River at flood stage on dry ground. And tell them how God brought them out of Egypt back 40 years ago and brought them through the wilderness as they wandered through the wilderness for 40 years. All the difficulties and all the blessings and all the things that we struggle with and all the things that we have pleasures of. And we, we take time to tell them the remembrance of what God did for us on this occasion. Come on, are you hearing me this morning? So every time they would come down there, they'd say, Johnny and Susie, let me just tell you, how many of you know there's no Johnny and Susie's hardly anymore? I'll just use a couple of my kid, grandkids' names, Zephira, uh, Memphis. Let's see, what's another one? <laughs> Sage, yeah. I mean, not, nobody's Johnny and Susie anymore. Hello? I, I know these kids' names. I pray for them every morning. And I just drew a blank. Just Zephira, Juniper. Uh, then there's Joshua, Eternity. Then we have Isaiah and Ezekiel in one family. The other family is, is uh, Memphis and Sage. So, man, not a Johnny there. Think about that. Out of eight grandkids, not one of them's got what we would call the common name. Well, Joshua was the Bible name, but yeah, but not Johnny and Susie. But think about it. Johnny and Susie, look at this pile of rocks. Yeah, what does that mean, Dad? Man, we were, we were in the desert for 40 years, and before that, we were in bondage for 400 years. And God brought us out of one place, and we crossed over the, the Red Sea. I mean, that was a miracle in itself. Let me just tell you about that and how the walls just come up, and we went across on dry ground, and then we wandered in the desert for 40 years. And then after that, we brought us to this Jordan River, and boy, it was swollen out of its banks. And, and God brought us across on the other side, and and it was after that that we went up to this city that looked like the biggest walled city we'd ever seen. It was a town by the name of Jericho. And we marched around the city seven times. And on the seventh time, we blew the trumpet. And we shouted. And all of a sudden, without us drawing a sword 
or doing anything, the walls of that city came crumbling down. How many of you know God's able to do the miraculous? I'm telling you, that stone pile there is to remember what has happened and what has taken place. Can I hear it? Amen. Just as today, we think about those military who have given their lives across the world and trying to defend our nation. God has given us victory over and over and over again. Well, we've talked about how God delivered them uh, from the Passover. We talked about how God delivered them good and through the, the Red Sea and also the Jordan. Now, let me just take you to a place. And, and I want to read this verse because she's probably got it up. Verse 7, there it is. These stones, he said, shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. How many of you know forever means keeps on going? Amen? Let me look at my third memorial I want to talk about. How many of you remember a woman who anointed Jesus at Bethany? You say, well, what's so great about that? Well, let me just read to you. Matthew 26, it says in verse 13, when Jesus was at the house of Simon the leper, a woman anointed his head with oil. And Jesus said, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. You see, there were guys in that group that were saying, man, don't you know that this could have been sold and we could have, we could have took care of people forever and ever. I mean, we would have had so much money, but they poured that, that oil and that perfume on top of Jesus. It was a waste. Jesus said, what do you mean it was a waste? She was preparing me for my death. She was preparing me for my burial. She was doing something that she knew she needed. She gave her very best. How many of you know God wants your very best? And he said, let, me, let it be a memorial to her wherever this gospel is preached. So it doesn't matter if it's preached in Hilliard or in Callahan or if it's preached over in Thailand. Hello. It doesn't matter if it's in, in China. It doesn't matter if it's in Cuba. It doesn't matter where this gospel is being preached. It's going to be a memorial when people hear what God did and how this woman used what she had to anoint the Savior's body with oil. Matter of fact, it tells us in that thing, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. My last one that I want to share with you, number four this morning, is one that I care very much about, and I hope you do too but it's the Lord's Supper. Stop and think about it for just a minute. On the night that before Jesus was crucified, he instituted the Lord's Supper. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 19, the Bible says that he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance. Listen, in remembrance. Let me say it one more time. In remembrance of me. Every time we participate in communion, in holy communion, and we take the Lord's Supper, it is to remind us of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Can I hear an amen? Come on, somebody. You see, the observance of the Lord's Supper is an ongoing Christian memorial. It was established on that night before Jesus was betrayed, before he was crucified. It's ongoing. It's a Christian memorial that helps the believers to remember the sacrifices that Jesus made for us. Let me just read to you how Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had blessed it and given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. How many of you know Jesus is still coming? Let me say it again. Jesus is still coming. 
We don't know at what moment, but at any moment, the trump may sound. And when the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those of us who remain shall be what? Caught up to, in the air to be with him forever. I don't know about you, but that's what I'm living for, amen? I'm living to be with Jesus. I'm living to, to see my Savior. I'm living to experience my true salvation and what it means to be able to live for eternity, forever and ever and ever. Everything else on this earth is going to pass away. But heaven and earth, come on, let me tell you, it's going to be great when God creates this new heaven, new earth. All things become new, and that's what I'm looking forward to. You see, memorials are a reminder of what has already taken place. Let me say it again. A memorial is something to remind us of something that has already taken place. Christian memorials can help build our faith because it's like reading the Word of God. How many of you know faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the Word of God. When we hear the stories of how God worked miracles and we read them, and as we read of the, the memorials and hear and the great things that God did, what does it do? It builds our faith and causes us to grow and mature to become the men and women of God that he wants us to be. Christian memorials not only build our faith, but they also remind us of God's provision. If he did it before, how many of you know he can do it again? Can I hear an amen? Some of you say, well, man, I sure wish you'd hurry up. How many of you know God's always on time? He's not on your time, but he's on his time. And he works all things out for his good and for his glory. Sometimes we might have to go through a little bit more fire than we want to. But guess what? It makes us appreciate him all the more when he shows up and he makes it happen. You see, Christian memorials can also motivate us to keep us going. Sometimes we have a tendency to want to give up and quit. I know there's nobody ever thought about that here. I'm going to tell you, even as a pastor, there are days that I just want to say, God, I'm tired of this. People are hard-headed. Knuckleheads. You feed them the word, you give them the word, and they do everything else. And the Lord just tells me, said, son, it's not your job. All you can do is give them the word. You can't make the decisions for them. All you can do is teach them and disciple them the best you can. And then it's up to me to influence them and they have to make the right decisions. How many of you know it's up to us to make our own decisions? You can make good ones and you can make bad ones. How many of you know when you're raising your kids, you influence them up to a certain point, but when they get to a certain age, you have to take your hands off and say, hey, God, thank you for the years that you've allowed me to invest into their lives and teach them the importance of the Word of God, to train them and disciple them and bring them into church. You know, I've told you this. You heard Barry Young say it the other day when he was here about we had a drug problem. Yeah, we were drugged to church every time the doors were open. That was the only drug problem I ever had. I was drugged to church. Thank God my parents drugged me to church when I didn't want to be there. They didn't say, well, I don't want him to run away from God. Well, let me tell you what. If you don't get him in the right direction now, you're never going to get him in later. It's harder and harder and harder. Invest into them now. Put it into them now while you have the chance. You see, memorials are there to encourage us and help us and build us and keep us from quitting. I look back at the stones and I said, God, you got them across on dry land. You can get me across this situation. God, I've been through deep things before, but Lord, I know you brought me through before and you can do it again. And I have to get myself together when I get discouraged. Hello, anybody hear me? And I have to say, Lord, I put my trust in you. For when I can't do it, I know the Holy Spirit can. And I have to trust him. Let me bring this to a close. 
What kind of memorials have you established in your own life with God? What about the day that God miraculously saved you? Can you remember the day? Is there a time and place where you could sit back and say, God, I remember where I was. And I thank you for bringing me out of the mire and the clay and the pit that I was in. Hello, anybody hear me? What about the day the Lord filled you with the Holy Spirit and gave you that supernatural anointing in your life? I remember the day. I can tell you today. I can tell you exactly where I was when I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I remember I was at a church by the name of Bethel Temple down in Tampa. And that church, this is before they built their new buildings and all this. And I was down in the front of the church. And I've been seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit for, for quite some time. All my family, seemed like my friends, my cousins, everybody had been filled, but not me. And I'd never been given the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I was really disappointed. God, why can't I have it? Why? And I remember going to the altar. And people would crowd around me. And they'd lay hands on me. And they would say, oh, speak it out, brother. Speak it out, brother. And I was like, what? 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 Speak it out. Hold on. Hold on. Turn loose. Hold on. I didn't know whether to hold on or turn loose. I mean, I was, I was like, God, I'm just confused. But that was Pentecost. And I'm sitting there. And all of a sudden, a man that was working with the youth, he was a, just a helper to the youth. He wasn't even the youth pastor. But he come up and he says, Arlie, he said, look, the Holy Spirit's all over you. I can sense it. He says, all you've got to do is just repeat what you hear the Spirit of God saying in your spirit. Let it go. And all of a sudden, I, I, I kept thinking the Holy Spirit was going to make my tongue work. <laughs> but he, does, he doesn't do that. Holy Spirit, he puts it in your spirit, and then you begin to speak what the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And I kept thinking, well, I think that's what he's saying, so I don't want to be speaking what he's saying. I mean, we, we try to think things out in our head so much. And I kept trying. I said, well, but certainly that's what they're saying. And, and I, I was down there, and they were all over me, hold on, turn loose, do this, do that. And I was like, and, and finally I just said, okay, Lord. And I said the first word that I sensed in my spirit that God was saying to me. And then it began to come. And I remember getting up off the floor that night and there was a newness inside of me like I'd never felt before. It was like a spring of living water flowing out of me. And I was in, I was in high school. So I remember this memorial. I was in high school. And the church was repainting the eaves and doing things around the building. So they were using me. I was making a couple dollars an hour, you know, scraping and painting and doing that. And I went over there that day and I got on the ladder and I got, I was by myself and all of a sudden I was going, and I couldn't speak in English. I mean, I could, but I, I just didn't want to. I mean, it was just the Spirit of God had become so anointed and powerful in my life. It was something I, I just didn't want to shut off. How many of you know what I'm talking about? It was like the power of God was flowing. And from that moment forward, Life has never been the same. The power and the anointing of God is so powerful. So yes, I have memorials in my life of what God's done. And I'm challenging you today. What kind of memorials do you have in your life? Maybe it was a day that God miraculously healed you. Maybe you were dying with some kind of sickness or disease or, or whatever it is. You go back and say, well, I remember on such and such day, God touched my body and healed me. You say, why is it important that we know these things, Pastor? Because there are going to be times in your faith that you're going to get weak. There are going to be times that you get discouraged. There are going to be times in your life you're wondering, God, how come you never do anything for me? You always do it for everybody else. Let me tell you, He's already done it for you. He saved you. He healed you. He delivered some of you from addictions in your lives. When you start feeling sorry for yourself, you need to go back to these memorials and let them look at it and say, God, you're the same God today as you were yesterday. You don't change. Are you hearing me this morning, church? 
What about the day that God delivered you from, from some addictions in your life? You see, as we celebrate this Memorial Day weekend, I want you to take just a few minutes to consider some of the miraculous things that God has done for you in your lifetime. Maybe it's time to establish some of your own memorials that you'll remember so that when you get discouraged, you can look back and say, God, you did it before. And God, you can do it again. Can I hear an amen? Stand with me all over this church. I've asked if they would sing that song. We sang the last song a while ago. Will you just join in with this song? And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I think most of you here probably do that I've seen. But if you're here and you say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus or I'm backslidden. And you want to just get things right with God this morning, I'm going to go down front. I'm going to invite you to come and I'm going to pray with you. We'll get things straightened out before you leave. We'll make a new memorial today. And if you need a healing or whatever, come. We'll, we'll pray over anybody that's sick, whatever you need today. But let's sing this song together. Amen.
Love the Lord. Amen. Come on, let's give him some praise. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for all that you do in our lives and all in our hearts, God. Thank you for the memorials that we have 
not only in the United States as Americans, but God, the Christian memorials that you have given us to remind us of your great works and all that you do. Lord, as that song sang earlier on today, God, we don't seek after the blessings, but we seek the blesser, God. We seek you, Father, and that's what we want is a closer walk with you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great weekend. We hope to see you on Wednesday night. Amen. Good job, Alicia.